Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I'm so glad that you've uh, decided to tune me in today on Channel 17 Fact, Flint Area Community Television for my uh, uh, regular broadcasts on fr Friday afternoon from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. Lessons in Church History, Richard Allinger Presents. Extra, extra, read all about it. Look at the headlines. This is the Concerned Pastors for Social Action Courier. And let's look at the headlines. Look at this beautiful woman here. Believe it or not, she is now uh, our mayor, has citizens of the city of Flint. Extra, extra, read all about it. Dr. Karen Weaver is the new mayor of Flint. Extra, extra, read all about it. Dr. Karen Weaver is the first woman uh, ever elected mayor uh, in the city of Flint. And Flint's been a city since almost Abraham Lincoln was president in 1856. Extra, extra, read all about it. Look at these headlines of the Concerned Pastors for Social Action Courier. Let us take a closer look at it. It says, Mayor... Karen Weaver, Ph.D. History was made in Flint, Michigan when Dr. Karen Weaver, Ph.D., was elected mayor November 3, 2015. She defeated incumbent Mayor Dane Walling by 56% to 45% margin and thus became the first woman to be elected in this position. I must emphasize that Dr. Weaver is a black woman. Dr. Weaver has long been involved in civic and community organizations, Flint and Genesee County. She served on the Hurley Board of Managers and the Mott Foundation uh, Board, uh, to name a few. Dr. Weaver was born in Flint, Michigan, the daughter of Marion Coates Williams and Dr. T. Wendell Williams, M.D. Her mother, Marion Coates, was the first black teacher at Fairview Elementary School. That was a cause for celebration because blacks were not hired in the teaching profession. I was privileged to have been one of her students, uh, says the writer of this article in the Courier. I, uh, she is the youngest of three children, and she and her husband, Dr. Rex Weaver, also have three children who are all attending college. Dr. Weaver attended the University of Michigan Flint and received a bachelor's degree from uh, Tugelo College in Mississippi, a master's degree from Long Island University, and her Ph.D. in psychology from Michigan State University. She and her husband also have a business. As our first female mayor, I hope, Mayor Weaver, that you wear the mantle well and that you make us proud. We congratulate you and wish you and the city of Flint well. Now that was this side of the article and this is that uh, beautiful picture of our new female mayor here, Dr. Karen Weaver. And then there was one other article on the front page. Oh, they, they said that uh, November 11th was Veterans Day uh, up here at the top of the Concerned Pastors for Social Action Courier. So I want to thank all of the veterans uh, in our country for serving, and I thank you for making our country a safer place to live. November 11th was Veterans Day also. Now this is the other article of our new mayor, Dr. Karen Weaver. Karen Weaver makes history for Flint. Karen Weaver has indeed made history for Flint in the most positive way. Not only is she the first female to head this city, but the first African American to sit in the seat of mayor in this predominantly African American city since 2002. In a city that has been under several emergency financial managers, our resources being redistributed without transparency, our city services being diminished, and our voices being disregarded, it is a resounding victory for the citizens of Flint to regain their voices again. The critical issues this city will face in the coming months and years needs a fresh approach and a deep commitment from its leaders. 
It takes a dedicated leader who values each resident and fully understands that we all matter and we all are uh, stakeholders in the future of the city. Dr. Karen Weaver has accepted the challenge and is ready, willing, and able. We all need to put our prayers and efforts behind Karen Weaver for the benefit of this community. A house divided cannot stand. It will take all hands on deck to turn this city back to the vibrancy that it once held. We should all want our neighborhoods to be habitable and safe. We should all want our water uh, to be drinkable and affordable. We should all want our small businesses to be supported. We should all want opportunities for jobs to be the centerpiece of our financial stability. In payroll, excuse me, in the early 70s, our city was number one per capita in payroll. It was a vibrant city. Let me repeat that. In the early 70s, our city was number one per capita in payroll. It was a vibrant city with thriving neighborhoods and a model across this nation for public education and community policy. We need to all stand together behind the community focused leader to bring Flint back to its greatest days. When we vote, we win and we won. Again, look at this nice beautiful photo of our new mayor. Now this was the uh, November 8th issue of 2015 of the Coyer, and this is the November 15th issue of the Coyer, uh, and it's another extra headline. Extra, extra, read all about it. Flint's first female mayor sworn in. Extra, extra, read all about it. And it says right here that November 15, 2015, Courier of the Concerns Pastor Social Action Courier, Flint's first female mayor sworn in. Proclaiming that on November 3rd, 2015, she saw mustard seed faith in action. Mayor Karen Williams Weaver mesmerized a standing room only crowd at Flint City Council Chambers with an inauguration speech that pulled no punches. To those who questioned her audacity to run for mayor, she said, to the experts, we were defeated even before the votes were cast. No money, no statewide network, uh, no behind the scene benefactors, no plan, no experience, but God, but God, but God, but God. We stepped out on faith. And she said in her speech, acceptance speech, we've come this far by faith, trusting in the Lord. But God, we stepped out on faith. Faith in ourselves, faith in each other, and faith in our collective resolve to bring needed change and to give Flint residents a democracy they so rightfully deserve. The crowd stood on its feet when Mayor Weaver proclaimed, On November 3rd, Flint residents said in a loud, clear voice that they were sick and tired of high water bills, sick and tired of poison in the water, sick and tired of being under valued and marginalized, sick and tired of double talk and political speak. They said to me over and over again, we want real change. We want real change. Not a reasonable facsimile thereof, but we want real change. We want real change. They said, we want a new direction. They said, we want a we want to chart a new course. Let me read that again. They said, we want a new direction. They said, we want to chart a new course. And so, my friends, I want to make it abundantly clear that I didn't knock on hundreds of doors, rise early every morning to do double duty as a political candidate and small business owner. I didn't attend countless church services and social functions to arrive at this moment of investiture. This sacred moment of commitment and reflection, this moment of historical importance to turn back now. We've come this far by faith, 
trusting in the Lord. Mayor Weaver cautioned her supporters, however, that there will be no quick fixes to what ails the city of Flint. I have said since the election that I am not interested in radical initial changes in city government operations, she said. In the interim, I plan to work cooperatively with the city administrator, city council, and the transition advisory board. I understand the governor and his advisors want to see a strategic game plan that reflects capacity and competency. My pledge is that the Weaver administration will demonstrate the capacity and political will necessary for self-governments. To another rousing round of applause, she continued, however, I can't perform this awesome responsibility alone with one hand tied behind my back and a blindfold on. That's not fair competition. Lawrence Moon, president of the Lawrence E. Moon Funeral Home, presided over the inaugural event. Others on the program included Dr. Jesse Muldrew, Reverend Wallace Hill, pastor of Mount Pisgah Missionary Baptist Church, Reverend Alfred E. Harris, president of the Concerned Pastors for Social Action, Reverend Byron Moore, pastor of Vernon Chapel AME Church, and Mayor's Church Home, uh, Bishop uh, Bernadelle Jefferson, uh, uh, pastor of Faith Deliverance Center, and Reverend Dan Schneed, pastor of St. Paul Episcopal Church, and uh, vocalists included Lennox Burroughs and Joanne uh, Kerrigan. The oath of office was administered by uh, the Honorable William Crawford, Jr., 68th District Judge. And the, after the swearing-in service, the prayer of benediction and dismissal was made by uh, Dr. Henry Fuller. Now, as, as you know in previous programs, Dr. Henry Fuller is the, uh, not only the pastor-teacher of the Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church, 4805 North Saginaw Street, but housed in North, uh, housed in Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church is the United Theological Seminary satellite, and he is the president of that satellite. And also, uh, Reverend Wallace Hill, who gave the scripture reading at the inaugural mayor's inaugural uh, swearing-in service, is on the staff at UBI, United Theological Seminary in Mount Calvary. He is a teacher there, and uh, so. Uh, we are a uh, are there there's a lot of potential in Flint now with especially our new mayor look again at this wonderful picture of our new mayor look at her smile she has isn't, isn't that a beautiful photo of her being sworn in uh, all right now I am going to break for station identification and a few commercials that will benefit you but when you come back I have a few more comments about how women now are coming into their own uh, here in the 21st century. God bless you, and I hope that you come back. -O what if we... Why can't we? Why not? Our voices. Our voices. What would happen to me? How many times have I said? Not everybody's bad. You know what's the problem? There's other people. I like it. I've heard. WFOB. What? WFOB. Our voices. 259-978 Flint's newest radio Our station. Voices. Located right here in Flint, Michigan. The Our Good voices. News Radio. If you're interested in getting involved, having your own show, or just supporting the station, give us a call at 259-9789. That's 259-9789. It's our voices, located right here in Flint, Michigan, the Good News Radio. If you're interested in getting involved, having your own show, or just supporting the station, give us a call at 259-9789. Me in Flint Community Schools, Garden Education. Thanks to Food Corps Michigan, a partner in Flint's Community Education Initiative, students, families, and neighbors have an opportunity to discover the joys of growing their own fruits and vegetables. Learn more at flintcommunityed.org. Oh,
Okay, I'm so glad that you've joined me again. Now, uh, with regard to women coming into their own, uh, it wasn't until after World War I, in 1919, the, uh, a movement started. Uh, before World War I, women in this country didn't even have the right to vote. So in 1919 began the ratification of the Women's Suffrage Act to give them, in the last century, in the 20th century, the right to vote. Uh, women have come a long way, uh, and the uh, the and then on June fourth, uh, June fourth, uh, uh, it was June fourth uh, back. Uh, 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 Congress uh, passed the woman suffrage uh, uh, bill, which. In June 4th, 1919, it was before 1920 that they actually passed and ratified the Women's Suffrage Bill, uh, giving women a right to vote just after World War I. But it wasn't until August 18th, 1920, August 18th, 1920, that the uh, 19th Amendment was added to the Constitution, giving women the right to vote. Now, since now before women had the right to vote, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen. The, the America's first woman mayor uh, was Susanna Salter of a city called Argonia, Kansas in 1887. Now how she was able to do that was probably a miracle because women didn't even have a right to vote back in 1887. And so uh, that was America's first woman mayor was Susanna Salter in Argonia, Kansas in 1887. And since that time Women in major cities all over the world started ascending to position, uh, elected positions of mayors of cities. Uh, there have been many women mayors in the 19th, 20th, and 21st century now since women have had the right to vote. Um, now, the, uh, the first African-American uh, woman to ever be elected mayor was in 1987. Her name was Carrie uh, Saxon Perry of Hartfield, Connecticut. She was the first African-American uh, woman to be elected mayor of a major city. And then the second lady uh, to be elected, African-American woman to be elected mayor, was uh, November 6, 1990. Uh, Sharon Pratt Dixon was elected as America's second African-American woman as a mayor of Washington, D.C., sworn in January 2nd, 1991. So I thought you would appreciate to know that little bit of history with now that we, as citizens of Flint, uh, um, uh, do uh, have its first woman mayor in all of our history. Flint was uh, legally declared a city in 1856. And... Uh, I, before I uh, go on to the next subject of the program, I wanted to thank the writer of the uh, articles on the Concerned Passage for Social Actions uh, staff that uh, covered uh, the mayor's inauguration, Dr. Karen Weaver's uh, uh, e event so uh, very thoroughly. I really appreciate all the work they have done and would urge all of you, to, if you don't subscribe to the Concerned Pastors for Social Action Courier, do so and as soon as possible because they even have Sunday school lessons in there where they teach the Bible every in every uh, one of their weekly publications, good lessons out of the Bible. Right now, and you know, I haven't got time to go into them right now, because of what is else has to be talked about on the program today, but in the last two issues I just read to you, they were talking about Apostle Paul's missionary journeys that went to Africa, went to Arabia, went up to Rome, uh, uh, Paul and Peter going to Rome, and uh, Matthew uh, writing to the Hebrews in, in Jerusalem before it was destroyed by the Romans' uh, legions of army in 70 A.D., that, that's what's so great about the Courier. You can also uh, become more biblically literate by some of their publications that they have out of the Sunday School lesson, Uniform Sunday School lesson literature they print in their paper every week. Um, 
Now, what I would like to do in the remaining moments of this program is uh, read to you uh, out of a book uh, that was published by Word Publishing Company in Dallas, Texas. Uh, its copyright was 1992, and uh, the name of the book was called The Body, and um, uh, the author uh, was Alan Vaughn. And this is uh, what it begins to say. The holiest moment of the church service is the uh, moment when God's people, strengthened by preaching and sacrament, go out of the church door into the world to be the church. We don't go to church, we are the church. Uh, it was an astounding evening, uh, the Last Supper, Christ shared with his disciples. The men who had followed him for three years ran the gamut of emotions. Christ washed their feet, bro uh, broke their Passover bread, and passed them the common cup. He spoke of his death. He comforted them, confused them, and challenged them. We who follow Christ today read the biblical account of the remarkable meal and feel some of the same emotions, but we know, as his disciples soon discovered, that Last Supper was not an end but a beginning, the beginning of a whole new era. For within the extraordinary words Christ spoke to them is one of the most powerful secrets of his plan for us and for the world. I tell you the truth, said Jesus to the followers gathered at the Passover table. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. The disciples must have looked at one another in bewilderment. They had seen the master cast out demons and raise the dead. How could they possibly do that? But then their teacher went even further, adding, he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Uh, remember what Jesus said? Uh, uh, I, he said that uh, the world uh, uh, has been judged in uh, righteousness because I go to the Father. And uh, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So here he is saying, but... Then their teacher went even further, adding, uh, he, will even, he will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Greater things than these. How could this uh, ragtag lot of powerless men do more than Jesus? What in the world was he talking about? Uh, consider, uh, remember Jesus said, uh, they are judged their sin when Jesus came to those who he came to in his lifetime in the incarnation uh, in, 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 in the temple, all the Jews, the religious world at that time. Uh, uh, their sin was a rejection of him and his person. That was uh, the Father's only begotten Son, Jesus, in person, and they were rejecting him of righteousness because he said he was going to the Father, and of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. Now consider the context. Uh, Christ was poised uh, at the juncture between the conclusion of his earthly ministry and his death, uh, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. Uh, confined in the human experience, God incarnate in a human body with the limitations of time and space. He had for 33 years done the works and ministry to which God had called him. Now he was preparing to return to the right hand of the Father. I will ask the Father, Jesus promised them that night, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor or you can call him the comforter or the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. He will uh, bring to remembrance things that I have taught you and told you, and he will uh, uh, convict the world of sin. 
uh, and bring to remembrance things to come. Uh, and forever he will be with you. The Holy Spirit will be here uh, eternally in this earth. He will never leave. He will always be here. The Spirit of Truth. God would send his uh, send, God would send in his place the Holy Spirit who would enable his people to do all Jesus had commanded them to do. True to Christ's promise, the first disciples were empowered with the Holy Spirit a few weeks later at Pentecost, and from then on they began to fulfill his commission to them, carrying out his plan for his new earthly body. They proclaimed the good news. They baptized new believers and gathered them into communities, and under the seal of the Holy Spirit, the church began to grow. Hundreds, then thousands, then millions of believers began part of the body. Generations of Christians, gifted in a thousand different ways and empowered by the same Holy Spirit, invaded every arena of human life, every country, every field of endeavor, bringing the truth to bear on their surroundings. In his earthly ministry, Jesus was limited to one human body. Now the body of Christ is made up of millions and millions of human bodies stamped with his image, his followers. That includes you and me. For Jesus prayed for us that last evening, uh, not just for the disciples who were with him in John chapter 17, but for us. My prayer is not for them alone, he told the Father. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Okay. In the last minute of this broadcast, I'm going to uh, finish up this uh, uh, excerpt by uh, Ellen Vaughn in her book called uh, The Body. What an astounding thought! Jesus ascended, but his spirit descended to empower his body, the church, to do more than he could accomplish as one person. Now, in the last uh, 30 seconds, I want to uh, hold up this, and I want you to notice here, uh, a lot of people in Flint who have participated in the Prayer Chain Day for 10 years, the 10th Annual Prayer Chain Day, the 10th Annual Prayer Chain Day is coming up again downtown on the City Hall, uh, and it's going to be this Yom Kippur in October. And a lot of people don't know that the Prayer Chain Day has a website. Can you see it? Can you see it? All right, uh, the, the Prayer Chain Day website is uh, www, that means World Wide Web, Flint, is it Flint Prayer Chain Day? Flint Prayer Chain Day dot org. That is the website, people. So remember, there is a website you can go to with regard to the 10th Annual Prayer Chain Day coming up this Yom Kippur. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. W-F-O-V. What if we... Why can't we? What mission? Why not? Our voices. Our voices. What would happen if we... I'm going to tell you about it. Not everybody's 
know what the problem is. I watch. I heard. WFOV. WFOV. Our voice is 259 978 Flint's newest radio Our station. Business. Located right here in Flint, Michigan. The Our Good business. News Radio. If you're interested in getting involved, having your own show, or just supporting the station, give us a call at 259 9789. That's 259 9789. It's our voices. Located right here in Flint, Michigan. The Good News Radio. If you're interested in getting involved, having your own show, or just supporting the station, give us a call at 259 9789. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so glad you're back to join Church History. In, in the light of this awesome truth, it is uh, scandalous that so many believers today have such a low view of the church. They see their Christian lives as a solitary exercise, Jesus and me, or they treat the church as a building or a social center. They flit from congregation to congregation, or they don't associate with any church at all. That the church is held in such low esteem reflects not only the depths of our biblical ignorance, but the alarming extent to which we have succumbed to the uh, obsessive individualism of our modern and postmodern culture. Uh, of course, every believer is part of the universal church, but for any Christian who has a choice in the matter, failure to cleave to a particular church is failure to obey Christ. For it is only through a uh, uh, confessing local body of believers that we carry out the work of the church in the world. It is within the church particular that we commit ourselves to imitate relationships with fellow believers and submit ourselves to accountability, duties, and responsibilities. In this community, our Christian character is shaped. It is the context in which our spiritual gifts are developed and exercised. It is the family whose ties cannot be broken. It is the training camp of, that disciples uh, and equips believers to be God's people against the world and for the world. If, if we don't grasp the intrinsically uh, corporate nature of Christianity embodied in the church, uh, we are missing the very heart of Jesus' plan. But when we do understand that the church is Christ's body, uh, what next? What does this one body with many parts look like? What does it do? What is uh, its mission in the world? Well, these these questions uh, that it, uh, these questions uh, that I want you to be in prayer about the the questions that I have asked you. These are the questions that I want you to be in prayer about about the body of Christ. Now, because October 31st this year was the uh, uh, 498th anniversary of uh, Martin Luther uh, nailing the 95 indictments or thesis against the Roman Catholic Church on the University of Wittenberg door, doors, I wanted to read this particular uh, uh, excerpt out of uh, The Body by uh, Alan Vaughn's book, Justice Unleashed, A World Transformed. The task of a people of God, as far as possible in a sinful society, to reclaim the cosmos for God's created purpose. The day after Martin Luther uh, strode out of the assembly hall at Worms, his valiant stand seemed likely only to make him a sitting duck for the powerful men who opposed him. Even Luther himself could never have dreamed of the consequences that would uh, flow from his courageous, if perspiring, confession. After pondering the monk's position, Emperor Charles V proclaimed his own, I am descended from a long line of Christian emperors. I have resolved to follow in their steps. A single friar who goes counter to all Christianity for a thousand years must be wrong. Therefore, I am resolved to stake my lands, my friends, my body, my blood, my life, and my soul. I will proceed against Luther as a notorious heretic. And proceed he did, forbidding his subjects to offer Luther food, drink, or shelter, and ordering anyone who came upon the beleaguered monk to arrest him. But the emperor was distracted. 
Also, the uh, uh, the Pope at Luther's time was burning all the Greek and Hebrew scriptures. That is the original languages, the original the original biblical languages that the Holy Scriptures were in during the 16th century. Uh, he was burning the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. They were burning all the original biblical languages of Hebrew and Greek up. However, uh, Luther continued uh, translating from his copies of the Hebrew and Greek uh, scriptures and putting it into uh, uh, German. But the emperor was distracted by convulsions who swore uh, to have a R Luther arrested. But the emperor was distracted by convulsions elsewhere in his empire. Revolts in Spain and threats from the Turkish ruler to the east, Suleiman the Magnificent. Meanwhile, the French king Francis I claimed a number of territories that Charles claimed has his own. And Pope Leo X, remember I told you he was burning up all the Hebrew and Greek scriptures, and they only had Latin, and they kept that Latin Bible chained to their pulpit in the Roman Catholic Church. They wouldn't let people have the Bible in their own language. They wanted to keep people ignorant of the scriptures and the teachings of Jesus. Uh, Leo, the, that's Pope Leo X, uh, often cast his lot with the French king over Charles. Thus, busy monitoring rebels, fighting infidels, squabbling with the Pope, and trying to keep his own balance on the slippery slope of the 16th century politics, the emperor let Martin, Lu the emperor let Martin Luther slip away, uh, even though he had intended to really uh, mightily persecute him. Other uh, things were going on at that time that helped Martin Luther continue his work for the Lord. Immediately after the Diet of Worms, Luther was abducted by friendly forces and hidden in the castle at Wartburg, where he lived, disguised as a knight, until early in 1522. Cut off from the heat of the battle and shut up in a, the chilly, silent castle, Luther's natural disposition began to manifest itself again, as it had in the cloister. As he wrote furiously, producing nearly a dozen books and translating the New Testament from Greek and to German, he also suffered from constipation, insomnia, and depression. Woes even lesser writers know quite well. Uh, modern distortions and reductions of Martin Luther abound. Many lay Catholics know him as a mad monk who broke up the Catholic Church and was somehow responsible for Protestantism. Many Protestants knew him only as the dissident who nailed up the 95 Thesis. Whatever those were and composed, a mighty fortress is our God, is a song that he sang. Secular observers see Luther as simply an odd textbook figure sandwiched somewhere in the midst of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance or they celebrate his autonomy as the new man standing counter to Christianity as it had been practiced for a thousand years. The modern man emerging from the, stel uh, the stellifying domination of the superstitious, superstitions of the Middle Ages. But Luther, but Martin Luther was more than a mad monk. A composer of thesis, the 95 indictments against the Roman Catholic Church, or an enlightened liberator. And this is why we tell his story. For Luther, one of the most significant figures in Christian history, profoundly shaped the character of the Western civilization and many of the structures of our modern world bear his stamp. What compelled this man to take his stand and loom so large in modern history? First, it was the flaming truth he saw. Christianity is no mere creed or confession. It is ultimate reality in Jesus Christ. The scriptures are God's authoritative word, the revelation of truth. Convinced of this, Luther had no choice but to stand for truth, even if it meant taking on the power structure of his day. Second, it was the very nature of his radical discovery within the scriptures. For as he sat in the flickering candlelight pouring over the scriptures, Luther discovered that the central theme of all scripture was the justice of God. When Isaiah admonished the Jews to do justice, and Amos thundered, let justice roll down like living waters. The Hebrew word for it used for justice is uh, sadiq, literally meant righteousness. It was God's declaration that men 
and women of social structures must be in conformity with the standards of the just and holy God. The New Testament sets forth the same standard, but it is embodied in Jesus Christ, who pays for our sins, bearing God's just judgment in his own body. Thus the Apostle Paul could write, We are justified, declared righteous by, a, by our faith in Christ alone. The biblical theme is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. The justice anticipated in the Old Testament, called forth by the law and the prophets, is fulfilled in the, in the new, uh, through Christ the mediator. No dichotomy between justice and faith. So, in that great moment when the gates of heaven swung open for him, Luther saw the whole biblical vision. God demands justice, that is righteousness, in all of the created order, and he declares men and women righteous by their faith. The Christian, then, must see all the world through God's eyes. Righteousness for the world, for the structures of society, and for all people. This leads to the biblical worldview which affects all of life. Our own age needs the same holistic view. In recent decades, many Christians' endeavor, uh, endeavors have divided into two camps, social uh, activists in one and soul winners in the other. Those seeking to right injustices to meet human needs have been accused of abandoning their classic Christian call to evangelize the lost. Meanwhile, the social activists deride soul winners for being concerned only with uh, altar calls and notches in their Bible belts. And failing to see the true definition of justice, many Christians slice the scriptures in two, evoking images of an angry Old Testament God, bringing vengeance upon those who dis disobeyed his laws, exacerbated by the King James translation of justice as judgment or the New Testament caricature of a God who has discarded his law in favor of showering grace on everyone. The connection is clear in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, where the Greek word for justification is uh, dikai sune, is the term used, translate in various cognates as uh, sari, the Hebrew, term for justice. People further the confusion by defining justice in secular terms. Everyone getting his or her due, then politicizing that interpretation depending on their partisan leanings. Conservatives often suppose that justice means punishing wrongdoers, while liberals assert that it means everyone getting a fair share of society's benefits. Both are uh, embraced within, but fall far short of the full biblical meaning. How desperately the modern church needs to recapture the full bi biblical vision of justice. And we need also to take hold of Luther's third great contribution to the church, the unity of biblical truth and its rele relevance to all life and integrated Christian worldview. In his monastery cell, Luther was reborn. The justice he had so feared has a uh, tumbril of God's gallows became the chariot of God's throne of grace. Galloping in that chariot with the winds of grace and freedom rushing through his head, Martin Luther cast his eyes over the landscape of his day and saw that it was all of the Lord's. From the farmer tilling the soil to the prince hearing the pleas of his people to the merchant selling his wares, to the child singing a small song. All of it was to reflect the righteous justice of the Lord of heaven and earth. All of it was to reflect right relations between people and their Lord, and right relations between people and their neighbors. All of it was to pro proclaim the glory of God. Luther's vision for biblical justice shaped not only his perspectives and actions, but launched a movement that swept across Europe. Its current surging uh, with new leaders, John Calvin, Yurik Swingley, Philip Melanchthon, John Knox, soon the entire continent was in the midst of a mighty and far-reaching uh, gospel revival and reformation. 
seized by this biblically informed view of life and realization that scripture made truth plainly known to men and women these reformers were moved by a holy passion filled with the fear of God the deepest reverence uh, of the Lord Almighty their 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 cry became coram dio in the presence of God the two Latin words coram dio means in the presence of God he refreshes and restores by his very presence and nothing could stop them has Luther sought to reclaim the faith from the cultural corruption of his church had unconsciously began to embrace over the centuries his work was less a radical new beginning than it was a reformation in the truest sense of the term a return to the essence of what the church had been in its noble past but the Reformation was more than a cleansing of ecclesiastical structures. Nothing was left untouched. The arts, the commerce, government, and education all came under its powerful influence. In chapter 13 of this book called The Body by Alan Vaughn, we discuss the foundation absolute truth provided for the whole Western history. But it was during the Reformation that the consequences of that belief had their most profound influence. Consider just a few examples of that influence as we now see it from the perspective of nearly five centuries, 500 years ago. 2017, October 31st, 2017, will be the 500th anniversary of this historic event of Martin Luther uh, nailing his 95 indictments against the Roman Catholic Church, the 95 Thesis on the University of Wittenberg door in Germany in 2017 that'll be the 500th anniversary of that historic event now as far as how did the Protestant Reformation affect politics and government well state and church had been wed in an unholy alliance since Constantine uh, in the third century after Christ had ascended and that all the apostles had been uh, martyred except John the Elder each using the other for its own purposes. With the gospel held hostage, the church could bring little reforming influence on culture. But the reformers, seeing God as sovereign and the church as the people of God, uh, wrenched free from the emperor's clutches and enabled the church to make a profound difference in societal values and structures. For one thing, the reformers changed the view of man in relation to the state. Luther's belief in the priesthood of all believers that men and women had direct access to God and need not go through any earthly mediator provided the philosophical foundation for political change. All men and women, whether sovereign or peasant, were equal in God's sight. God is no respecter of person. All were created in the image of God and imbued uh, with intrinsic dignity and all were fa fallen and in need of divine grace. And since the rights of the individual came from God, the state's powers could no longer be regarded as absolute, nor could a ruler's divine authority be a charter for arbitrary rule. One who expounded such radical ideas with particular uh, cogency was the Scottish minister Samuel Rutherford, a great scholar and disciple of John Knox's ministry. Rutherford wrote in a classic work, Lex Rex, The Law is King, in 1644, arguing that the truth of Christ could never be subordinate to Caesar. Only Christ's authority is absolute and arbitrary. God is the true seat of government. Rulers are merely trustees and stewards of God-given authority. The sovereign must administer law, not break, abrogate, or dispense with it. Public magistrates are public servants. Even the king, highest authority in the land, is a servant. Lex Rex laid the uh, philosophical foundation for a constitutional republic, the form that best balances man's intrinsic dignity with his inherent sinful nature that demands restraint. These principles were soon transported across the Atlantic. John Witherspoon, president of what would become Princeton University and the only clergyman to sign the Declaration of Independence advanced Rutherford's ideas in America's great constitutional debates. 
Thomas Jefferson also drew on Rutherford indirectly when he borrowed from John Locke. Locke, one of the Enlightenment's great thinkers, had himself been influenced by Lex Rex, secularizing Rutherford's concepts into his views of a social contract. In Inalienable Rights, Separation of Power, Consent of the Governed, and the Right of Revolution. That's why it was written in our founding documents by uh, our founding fathers in the colonial days of uh, the 13 colonies. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Though not a Christian, he composed his own Bible, uh, exc excising uh, with scissors all references to miracles. Jefferson nonetheless brought Christian-based ideas to the New World debate. So two streams, one from the Scottish reformers, the other from Enlightenment thinkers, drew from the common reservoir of the Reformation and converged in America with the first truly constitutional republic. Meanwhile, the forces unleashed in the Reformation were producing massive political and social reforms in England. The Reformation's biblical wor worldview and vision of justice drove John Wesley, William Wilberforce, Lord Shaftesbury, and Elizabeth Fry, and thousands of others in their crusade for the abolition of the slave trade, uh, the reform of values, and the uh, prevention of exploitation of children and workers in the mines and prisons, and the influence of those democratic ideas unleashed by the Reformation are still being felt, not just in Europe and America, but around the world in the closing years of this century. Now, that was the Reformation's effect in politics and government. Now, the Reformation's effect in vocation. Uh, remember, it is written in Revelation uh, that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. You have to remember that. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, how did the Reformation affect the vocation? Uh, well, while the priesthood of all the believers influenced the political sphere, Luther's view of God's sovereignty altered established uh, concepts of work and vocation. For one thing, it, uh, it rent the veil between the sacred and the secular. In God's sight, Luther wrote, the work of monks or priests was in no way whatever superior to the work of a farmer laboring in the field or a woman looking after her home. All work was no noble and worthy if it was done to the glory of God. His reasoning here was that God's creation was good and human beings were to be stewards of it. So work took on a holy character in the Reformation era. Vocation was considered one of the first steps of discipleship. People were to discern their skills and use them fully, to seek excellence and to shun idleness. The belief that people should pursue their individual callings broke down the, uh, uh, the rigid caste system, not only in the uh, church, but in society as a whole, paving the way for new economic and social freedoms. In this, radical though it sounded at the time, Luther was simply restoring the teaching of the early church fathers of that golden age, the first 500 years of the church, uh, that, that, that work had dignity and was a Christian virtue of duty, an act of service to God as master. Uh, by the 17th century, or the uh, 1600s, uh, by the 17th century, those whose religious convictions made them unwelcome in the old world fled to the new and brought with them this high view of work, later known as the Protestant work ethic. The virtues of industry, frugality, respect for property, and duty to community were firmly planted in the soil of the new colonies and produced the most vibrant and productive economy in human history. In time, that distinctively Christian ethic was secularized until recent years, its virtues remained ingrained in the American character. Uh, that was the Reformation's effect on vocation. Now the Reformation's effect on economics. 
The church had long embraced Thomas Aquinas uh, teaching that most work carried on for profit was immoral but the reformers insistence that all work could and should be done for the glory of God legitimatized successful commerce and profit thus in a very real sense the reformation made possible the emergence of what we know today as democratic capitalism this recognition of legitimate commerce could not have been more timely the plagues of the middle ages had decimated much of Europe's population but by the 1500s there was a population surge and 80 percent growth in Germany for example in one century increased forms of mobility aided commercial expansion and the craft guilds shifted to more capitalistic modes of production banking trade and commerce prospered all of which set the stage for a great industrial revolution with all that meant to uh, the development of the Western society. But along with this high view of work and commerce, the reformers demanded stewardship and social responsibility. In the, in the closing minute of this particular uh, segment, uh, I wanted to uh, read uh, this footnote that was by the 20th century uh, theologian Francis, Dr. Francis Schaeffer. Sadly, as Fra Dr. Francis Schaeffer points out, the church at large did little to actually guide the tide of increased wealth during the Industrial Revolution. While, while there were individual attempts to do so, for the most part, the church ignored biblical principles regarding the use of wealth. This lack of Christian compassion was particularly responsible for the abuses of the day, the slums in industrial towns, the exploitation of children and women in particular, the vast guilt, the vast gulf between the wealth of a few and the misery of many, and the growth of the slave trade. Re, re, reform uh, minded Christians eventually woke up and addressed these abuses. This was what Dr. Francis Schaeffer wrote in the last century before he left this slide. Uh, I hope that you can re I hope I hope that you can join me in the next segment. This is uh, uh, Richard Allinger in Lessons of Church History, and we'll pick up where I left off. Um, uh, again, I wanted to ask you all to be prayerful about uh, the new change that has taken place in the city of Flint with Flint's first uh, woman mayor, Dr. Uh, Karen Weaver, uh, the first person that Christ ever appeared to when he came back from the dead was a woman. So this is going to be a great change for our city, and I want you to join in with her in her administration and pray uh, for the city of Flint and the Prayer Chain Day uh, rally that's coming up this Yom Kippur. Um, in the last uh, segments of the church history lessons, I have been showing you how God has reformed his church through the centuries and we're gonna it's of such a lengthy matter that I'm gonna have to pick up uh, with some of this how God is reforming his church in other subsequent sessions so until then 